Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. Today, we've got a special treat for you in the house, in a remote location, in this really cool studio. Yeah, I like it. Uh, at our uh, 8% virtual conference. Billy uh, Williams just took the stage, Dr. Billy Williams, and uh, you lit it up in there. Well, I just, you lit I it just up in there. spoke from experience and knowledge. That's all. Well, welcome to uh, the Life Insurance Academy podcast. We have listeners all over the country, all around the world. Yes, sir. 39 countries listening to this podcast. Awesome. 39 countries, almost uh, 25 uh, plus thousand downloads a month now, listeners on the podcast. Look at you guys. People uh, just getting started, people considering a career in this business. Okay. Some veterans in the business, people learning how to build a business. They're inviting their new people to, to join in and listen. And I'm blessed and honored to have you with a fresh perspective today, a different perspective than we normally bring. Yes, sir. On this great industry of insurance sales. So you were just telling me you don't have a struggle story. I don't. I don't. I, I grew up in a wonderful two parent household, upper middle class. Uh, my dad was military 35 years mm -hmm. and my mom owned hairdressing shops and my grandparents owned uh, laundromats. And so we've always had that entrepreneurial part in our family. And then uh, I went to University of Southern California on a tennis scholarship. Uh, that tells you I a wasn't tennis a player. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't a struggle story if you go on a tennis <laughs> scholarship, right? So I um, went on a tennis scholarship. I wanted to go right into the army right after high school, but yeah. my dad was like, no, you got to go to college. And yeah. my dad was like my hero. So I went to college, got my uh, degree in biology at University of Southern California, and then uh, went right into the army, mm. stayed in for 21 years, retired. While I was in there, I got my I finished my master's, uh, worked on my doctorate for like 15 years until I finally finished that <laughs> at University of Chicago. And then once I retired, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, so here I was, I had this PhD. I had built a chain of gyms and sold it. So financially I was okay, but I knew I was young. I was only 41 years old. So yeah. it's like, okay, what am I going to do now? Huh. And I looked at all these different venues and all these different verticals and all these different whatever but the thing that always stood out to me was property and casualty insurance mm. and the reason why property and casualty specifically was for renewals at that time the life insurance industry wasn't paying the renewals that it's paying today correct this yeah. is 2003 2004 mm -hmm. they weren't paying the same levels mm -hmm. so but pnc was and i knew if i went into the pnc world mm -hmm. and i took all the discipline that I had from the army, the discipline I had from growing up and figured out the processes. I call it S4TS, standards, time, task, tools, training, and spot checking. If I put those in place in the insurance world, I could grow. So I started as a captive Allstate agent, mm -hmm. April 1st, 2004. Okay. Uh, in, in a little city called Mundelein, Illinois. Okay. And did really well. I won uh, like rookie of the year, super, super, I don't know, all the little stuff that they give you, won the trips, won the awards, won the whatever. But the one thing that always bothered me was, one, I was restricted by whatever Mother Allstate said. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It just wasn't my personality. Mother the, Allstate. Yeah, I Mother haven't Allstate. heard it referred to that. <laughs> yeah, wasn't, wasn't my personality. And the other thing is, I felt like if I'm doing this well, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm making... I think it was 17,000 a month or something after three years of, and that's, re I'm talking not revenue, I'm talking in my pocket, Income. I'm commissions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I'm making 17,000 a month after three years in commissions as a captive, what could I do as an independent? Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what, I, I'm gonna let this go. So I, re I resigned from Allstate April 1st, 2008, now, exactly could you take years. any of your clients with you or no. were, they were all states? No, no, they were all state clients, mm -hmm. but it's okay because this is where you, you prepare to do things. Mm -hmm. So the military always teaches you have a backup to a backup to a backup, right? So when I, whenever I wrote a customer, the first thing that I did when I was always ask that customer at that time, could you connect with us outside of just, you know, the database that I had you. So a lot of my customers would fill out. Uh, landing pages that we had. Sure. I would, I wrote a book, a little book. And so mm -hmm. they would download that book. Yeah. You know, they mm -hmm. would do all these other things. And then right around 2007, I started to ask all my customers to connect with me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Same. So I actually went into my book of business and sent out mass emails saying, connect with me on LinkedIn. Cause one thing your captive carrier cannot own is your social media. Correct. 
So 80% of my customers had connected with me on LinkedIn, which means when I got ready to leave, all I did was put out posts and announcements that, hey, I've left this and I'm going here. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing that they could do because I wasn't breaking any rules. I wasn't soliciting those customers. I was simply talking to my network. That's great. So, and then, then the rest from there, I started investing in agencies. I uh, invested my first one when I left. I didn't open my own agency. I actually partnered with an agency. And then I started investing in other agencies. I realized that a lot of people are great at insurance, mm -hmm. but they suck at running a business. Yeah. And I'm pretty decent at the business operation part of it. So I start putting out that I'm looking for investment opportunities, 5%, 10%, 12%. And I was amazed by how many people were like, I've been doing this for 30 years. If I could have someone else come in and take over hiring, training, and accountability, please. Mm. And so that's kind of how we, we grew. And that's how you grew. And then in 2012, I split off. No, 2011. I split off and started Inspire Nation, which was the mentoring arm of what we do. Okay. So that we had our investment side mm -hmm. and we had our mentoring side. Mm -hmm. So. And so you are now, I guess, the president and CEO of Williams Family Investment Group. Yes, sir. And Inspire Nation Business Mentoring. Tell you, I know you just mentioned that. Mm. Tell me how those correlate. Uh, what the relationship is there? Yeah, they're they're the same parent company, mm -hmm. which is Williams Family Investment Group. But one is a mentoring arm, and one is an investment arm. So let's say I came to you and I said, Hey, I really want to invest in your agency because I look at your demographics. I think you're going to grow. And you say, Nope, I don't want to sell any of my agency but I do want you to help me to grow my agency. Okay, we got a place for you. So go over to our mentoring side, we'll help you on the mentoring side. And if you say, oh, I love the, the, um, the investment side, then we go there. And a lot of our investments come from the mentoring side. Sure, because uh, you start the relationship first. Yeah, exactly, and agencies are like people. A lot of them don't think they're worthy of being invested in. Just like there are a lot of people who mm. don't think they're worthy of people putting their time, energy, effort, and money into them, Yeah. right? And so we find a lot of agencies are that same way. And then once we teach them how to be efficient and effective and move forward and, you know, how to hire right and how to train right and how to hold people accountable, then all of a sudden they're like, maybe I am worth you putting some money into. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they don't want you to invest, not because they don't want you, but because they don't want to expose themselves. Yeah. They don't want to expose their weaknesses, their weaknesses expose yeah. their flaws. They don't want those brought to the light. So. I think that's uh, I think that's a lesson in life too. Yes, I mean, most people don't really want people to look uh, behind the door of their, you know, the front door of their home because of what they might see. Exactly. I think there's a lot of brokenness, uh, you know, in the world, as a result of that, and people trying to hide behind the facade of what everyone expects. Yes. And yet it translates right from life to business, business to life. It's really no different because this is a people business. Well, you know, the problem. I have this thing. There are four levels of discipline. Mm. Self-discipline, accountability, automation, technology, and then delegation. A lot of businesses aren't as good as they could be because they won't allow anyone else to hold them accountable. Okay, they won't. They a lot of they won't even let their spouse know what's going on in their business. It's so probably a battle of the entrepreneur mind, really, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they're so embarrassed by what you're going to find mm -hmm. that they won't allow accountability. They won't allow automation and technology because they don't want to acknowledge that they're not tech savvy. Mm. So they limit the amount of automation and technology in their agency because they don't want it to shine, to outshine them. Correct. And then they use the excuse, well, people want that one-on-one -on -one and people really just, nobody wants an email anymore. They just want you to really call them. And it's like, no, tell the truth. You don't know how to send an email. <laughs> you know, you don't know how to set up automation. That's why you're not doing it. It has yeah. nothing to do with what you think people want. And then delegation. If you know you're not good at it, you know you won't hold yourself accountable, mm. you know that you won't allow anyone else to hold you accountable, and you know you suck at technology, delegate it. Hire someone else to do it. Mm. There are so many virtual assistant companies that are out. There's so many, you can go to Fiverr, you can go to Upworks, you can go to wherever, and find people that will do the things you're not good at doing. Mm -hmm. And even if you are good at doing them, there's some things you shouldn't do because it's not revenue smart. You know, it's like a speaker this morning, he was saying, I don't cut my own grass. And I'm the same way. I don't cut my own grass. Correct. Why? Not because I can't, but because I make a thousand dollars an hour. Why would I spend two hours cutting grass when I could pay someone 60 bucks to do it and go st spend my two hours and make two thousand dollars? 
That's not a smart investment. Mm -hmm. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I should do it. Yeah, yeah. What would you say to um, people who've been in the business for a little while, maybe three or four years in, mm -hmm. and they're still a single producing agent? They've never expanded out to say, hey, what would happen here if I hired some people? Or what's the possibilities of growing or developing an agency for, for, from your vantage point, mm -hmm. what do you see as the opportunity in the insurance space right now? Okay, so here's first we have to look at why they won't hire someone. Okay, that's the first thing. One, is it ego? Is it lack of leadership? Is it lack of technical ability? Why won't they hire someone? The next thing we have to look at is, okay, how much is it costing you not to hire someone? Mm -hmm. And so this goes back to a mindset of abundance versus scarcity. Okay, abundance versus scarcity. If I grew up with a scarcity mentality, we didn't have food on the table. I'm not saying this was our situation, but we, let's say a person said, we didn't have food on the table. We didn't have money. My family struggled. You know, I'm, I'm always worried about this. And then you get a little bit, mm -hmm. you easily get content. And, and so you you're like, lose that. right. You, yeah, and people fight harder to keep what they already have than they do to get something they never have. This is have. true. This is so true. now a person sitting there going, why won't I, uh, why would I hire somebody and it's just going to cost me more money? Because when you think from a, a, a scarcity standpoint, mm -hmm. you never think investment. See, abundance is an, is, is an investor mentality. Mm -hmm. Scarcity is a poverty mentality. So a person who thinks in a poverty mentality can't see that person they're hiring as an investment. They can't see that person becoming a multiplier. They only look at them as addition. Oh, they look at it as adding a new bill versus multiplying their revenue. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Now, what does that really tell me when I hear a person say that? They don't have processes. That's what it's really telling me. You won't hire somebody because you don't have the processes in place to make that person a revenue generator. So therefore, you're hiring them to just take the stuff off your plate you don't want to do. That's not a revenue generator. Hmm. You should have processes in place that says, if I bring this person on, it's because they're going to multiply my revenue, not add to my bills. Yes. We, uh, we were speaking in the lobby just a little while ago, mm -hmm. and you gave me the progression of what you're looking to do when you're looking, first of all, to add someone to support what you're doing. And mm -hmm. you took me through five levels. Okay. Uh, can you can you uh, break that down for our Absolutely. listeners? Absolutely. It's I call it the five levels of leadership. Mm -hmm. So level one is I want to be great. I want to be the best salesperson. I want to be the best person ever in insurance. Level two is I need help. I need somebody to take the stuff off my plate that's overwhelming me. That's you know really costing me. Level three is hmm. I need to hire someone else who can do what I do. It's no longer level two where I'm hiring for help. Mm -hmm. I'm now hiring for someone to actually duplicate and replicate mm -hmm. what I do. Level four is I wanna bring on a team of people who do what I do. And level five is I wanna invest in other people and other companies and other teams so that I can go do what I want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So level one and two are very personal. It's, it's a selfish, self-centered kind of a thing. I want to be great and I need somebody who's going to help me. Once you mature out of level two, you start decentralizing and you start going to a more team approach. Now you become a multiplier versus addition. Mm -hmm. So now I want to bring in someone who can do what I do, not help me but someone who can duplicate what I do. Yeah. And then level four, I wanna bring in a group of people. That's where the life insurance industry really excels mm -hmm. over the PNC industry. PNC tends to get stuck at level two. So we hire, you know, that's why there's so many agencies that have been around for 20 years and there's three people in the agency because the agent just hired help. Just someone to help them yeah, with their work. Just someone to help them. Mm -hmm. That's it. Someone to process this. And the agent doesn't give them any autonomy. Agent doesn't give them decision making, you know, authority. Agent, hell, a lot of times agent doesn't even give them admin access to, to their own technology. Yeah. Nothing. They're just help. Answering the phones. Exactly. Processing paper. Exactly. Where in the life insurance industry, it really is easier to 
to look at it from a team aspect. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, best, brightest of the life insurance are people who are out recruiting 150, 200, 300, 400, 5,000, like in PHP situation, 5,000 people to actually duplicate mm -hmm. what the founders did. Yeah. So those are the five levels. Level one is all about me. Level two is about me and help. Level three is all about my team. Level four is all about a bigger team. Mm -hmm. And then level five is I'm going to just put the money in. I'm not going to be the day to day operations. I'm not going to do whatever. I'm going to work on my business instead of in my business. And I'm going to go do the things that I enjoy, the things that I'm passionate about doing. That level three, mm -hmm. I need to find somebody or I need to hire somebody. Or well, level three is where you bring it on the first that, person to duplicate. That can do what I do, mm -hmm. right? Instead of helping me. Right. But so I can do what I do. What do you think is the roadblock, the mental roadblock? And what has to shift? What has to shift? I don't shift? think it's a mental roadblock. You said you, you called it decentralizing. Process. Yeah, I think it's process. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, Mental, I think most people know they need to hire, but they don't have the infrastructure to hire. They don't have the processes to hire. They, they're just going to hire somebody and both of you are going to sit there and look at each other and go, what do we do now? Where if there were processes in place, mm -hmm. if there was a structure in place, if they had standards and tasks and written processes and spot checking and accountability, mm -hmm. if they had all those things in yeah. place, then bringing on someone is easy. But so if we, they if, tend not to have If we rewind back in your career all the way back to when you first kind of said, okay, I'm, I'm, this is the first person I'm doing, I'm hiring to, mm -hmm. to do what I do. Did you have all the processes in oh, place? Yeah. Did you have all the structures? Yes. Place? Well, so Where did you the, learn those to implement them before you actually had a business? Well, in the Army. You got to remember, I'm, I'm Army. Yeah. So I grew up, let me give you an example. Uh, nowadays, they call this child abuse. Uh, but to me, it was a great childhood. So that's all I know. Mm -hmm. As a tennis player, I literally on weekends would play tennis from six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Mm. I would go out to the courts. I'd challenge anybody that was out there. Uh, I'd, I'd go to the most popular course and courts and just play all day. Right. Mm -hmm. But before I could go, I had to have a room inspection. My dad would get up at 530, six o'clock in the morning and I would have to have my room clean. My bed had to have hospital corners. Um, my, there, there couldn't be like my sink could not have any debris. My toothpaste and toothbrush had to be in their holder. My room had to be ready for inspection because my dad was like, if someone walks in our house, I want them, I want the house to be ready. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just get up and go like some people, you had to you know, follow a system. Before I had to you follow a process mm -hmm. and everything was a process. And you know, my dad was <clears> like, when you talk to people to carry on a conversation, who, what, when, why, where, how? You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you see a problem and then you need to help solve that problem, mm -hmm. what are the facts? What are the goals? What are the obstacles? What are the solutions? Mm -hmm. So everything I did was in a mm -hmm. process. I've always been a process person. So when I went, when I started my agency, the first thing I did was I started looking for the process. Now, Allstate was a great training organization. Mm -hmm. They had the process. They would give you books on books on books on books. And most agents would take those books put them on the side, put them in the bottom drawer and never look at them again. That was my Bible though. This is how you processed a car. This is how you did an endorsement. This is how you processed a claim. This is how you did all these other things. Yeah. And then I would tweak those based on my operations, but mm -hmm. I still, you know, to this day, I still use a lot of the stuff that I learned that Allstate gave me and that I tweaked with my military background. So no, from day one, I knew the only way I could grow was to have a process. Cause you gotta remember in the army and I, I went in the army in 1982, I retired in 2003. So in 1982, I went to Grenada. In 1987, I went to Panama. In 1991, I went to Bosnia. Okay, and I could keep going from there. But I'm, I'm just telling you, if I didn't have a process, yeah. people die. Yeah, or you don't come home. Well, yeah. because of my position in the army, I had people under me, I had people that were subordinate to me, mm -hmm. that I was responsible for decisions that yeah. affected their lives. Yeah. So if I didn't make good decisions and follow a process, people would come home. So I took that same approach in business. I take that same approach now. So with your investment group now, mm -hmm. where has the company grown to and what's the prospects for the next five years for you? we're about 170 partner agencies meaning i have investments mm -hmm. uh, equity in those and um we're about 1.3 billion 
I think my next billion is going to come on the life insurance side of mm-hmm. the house, which is why I'm here at 8%, mm-hmm. uh, because I really want to see what you guys are doing. Even though we dabble in it on the PNC side, mm-hmm. I want to really see what the top performers are doing. Yeah. You know, what the Fourniers and, you know, those guys <laughs> are doing and, and Cody and those guys. So I think our next billion is going to come from their next billion in, in a premium. And then after that, I think my ultimate goal <clears throat> I don't want to be a, an aggregator. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a PE. Like I don't want to just buy out mom and pop operations and you know bundle them up and sell them at stock and you know take them out to the market. That's not near. That's not my vision because I own other companies. I have other companies that I that I own yeah. and I'm invested in and other things. So I think at this point it's really about me preparing it to give to my kids hmm, and then let my kids decide what the next 50 years of this will be. I like that. It's about legacy. Yes. It's about legacy. I'm big on impact. I'm big on legacy. And uh, when I heard your story, I was like, we had to get you on here. Well, thank you. I'm honored. Thank you for squeezing in a little time right after you're uh, coming off stage. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed today. Uh, There's more to come. If you want to find out more about Dr. Billy Williams, where can they find you? Just go to our site, inspireanation.org. Inspireanation.org. We got a lot of free stuff out there that'll help agencies. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks for watching and uh, thanks for listening to another episode of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. We'll see you on the next one.